ACM is CIA. I tena squalowen e quit quits no last. Meets up, meets up, quit wheelum tena tamok, tena whalmok, slewatash, homathwiam e scotums og. Greetings to our honor guests and my dear ones. I have good feelings in my heart to see all of you today. In our language called Hakamitnam, I welcome you to the territory of Slaywatath, Musqueam, and Squamish nations. On behalf of the Pacific Legal Education and Outreach Society, I'm welcoming you to the National Network of Legal Clinics of the Arts Forum. Thank you all of you for being here. going to start with a bit of context. Um, this series uh, began in February um, when we talked about the broader issues of uh, board table disruption um, and disrupting some of the models around how we do things uh, around the board table. And one of the questions that comes up whenever I am in any conversation uh, about this issue or about about boards generally um, is um, can I get a lawyer on my board? Can you join our board? Can you be our lawyer? Can 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 do I need a lawyer? Sure, I need a lawyer. I must have a lawyer on the board. Um, in fact, the first workshop that I did uh, for the when we were the artist legal outreach. Um, at, I believe it was uh, Making a Scene, the Greater Vancouver Professional Theatre Alliance uh, annual conference, and um, a very uh, significant long-standing arts administrator said, um, in answer to my question about what are the legal issues that are facing the arts, well, the first thing is to get a lawyer on your board. And I, I stood there like a deer in headlights going, what? Why would you want to do that? Um, and so that sort of began this conversation uh, that I invited uh, Jean and Oase into her uh, today. Um, and we diligently tried to find another a lawyer other than myself who's been on an arts board um, to talk, but very few were willing to come forward today, which tells us something, I think. Um, so with that as the context for today, I'll uh, introduce uh, Jean Lesage, who's a great friend of uh, the arts in Canada and uh, had a, a short tenure here in BC and I was uh, happy to get to know her here and we've worked together since. Uh, she has her uh, company, uh, Lesage Arts Management. She's a certified HR leader. Um, CHRL, what does that stand for? Canadian Churl. Churl. Churl, an arts HR consultant is working with Mass Culture on the future of arts work research project, including a current focus on board governance innovation. Lesage Arts Management was born out of 30 years of excellence in executive arts management across many disciplines. By John, she's a respected senior arts management professional with national and international expertise with festivals and multidisciplinary performing arts. She's a sought after consultant, educator and conference speaker. And I'm really pleased um, that she's agreed to join us today. And with her uh, is Awais Lightwala, who's an arts leader and creative producer. He's currently an assistant professor in the School of Performance Faculty of Communication and Design at Ryerson University, where his teaching and research focuses on creative producing and arts management. Prior to that, he spent eight years as the managing director for Why Not Theatre, where he produced sold out runs of award-winning new works, national and international tours, presentations from around the world, and co-helmed the creation of innovative new producing models like Riser. So over to you, Jean. Great, thank you, Martha, and and hello to everyone. And I'm I'm very pleased to be zooming into you from from Takaranto uh, in Toronto, and which is the traditional territory of, of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat peoples. And Takaranto is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt 
covenant and um very grateful to live work and and play on these lands and i'm very grateful to to be here um my role today is to be a moderator so it's not that i don't have opinions about boards and legal side of of boards and i've got a cat about to come into frame um but i really want to i love the conversation we've already had with oase and martha so i think today is going to be a very very engaging discussion i've framed out a number of questions and i'm going to ask each of them to to give their points of view because these are two very smart folks with and with institutional experience and Martha side legal experience as well. And again, I'm going to say throw your throw your questions in the Q&A. We will have time at the end to address your questions. Just please throw it in the Q&A. And when you're asking questions, please don't quote anything specific about your organization and board. So we don't want to so the confidential cases. Um, let's stay generic and let's go. OK, so here we go. We may often hear that you need a lawyer on your board. So just as Martha was saying, and we often hear this, we need a lawyer on our board. So is this true? And if so, Oasis and Martha, what should they do? Should you have a lawyer on your board? Why or why not? Martha, I think you would like to begin, but I think you should begin. Sure. Martha, Martha. I just made a great joke. So I'll, I'm gonna say it out loud. I think we should ask the cat to be the lawyer on the board. I'm sure some of you must have seen the meme that, or the, 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 the guy who was using the avatar of a cat in his submissions in court that was circulating on social media, media a few months ago. I got that sent to me by dozens of people, which really made me feel good because I thought, well, that, that might be a good idea for me. I could become a cat. I wouldn't mind being a cat some days. Um, so, okay. Um, my answer to that question is actually generally no. Um, you shouldn't go into the, uh, the what well, I don't think it's, I think it's not the right question. The question should be, um, what is the board's current makeup? What is our mission? Who's our community? Why are we here? Um, and what do we expect our board to be doing? Um, I made the mistake um, of being a, a very early days. I was on the board of um, an organization that shall remain nameless. Uh, and in the first week, uh, first board meeting, uh, the um, artistic and executive director uh, stood in front of me and said, we just got served with a human rights complaint and put it in front of me and asked me to help with the response. And I, not understanding how the rules of professional conduct worked around these things, um, because it never occurred to me to actually read them apropos of whether or not a lawyer should ever do this, because we technically aren't supposed to, I went ahead and I drafted the response on behalf of that company to this human rights complaint because I was a human rights lawyer. So it was like, oh, sure, I can do that. Um, and it just didn't even occur to me um, that it was offside of uh, the, uh, the regulator, but it's also like, what a bad idea. Um, in part because many people think of lawyers as if, well, many lawyers think of themselves as being the fonts of all knowledge. Uh, we're not. You don't ask a real estate lawyer about a human rights situation. Right. And it's like asking a podiatrist uh, about your brain. Um, we don't do that. And, and yet we have this expectation that somehow this will avoid us ever having to hire a lawyer instead of what's the point of having, what, what is the role of a director, which is, yes, sometimes some lawyers are really good at providing guidance to boards and being supportive of, of the overall mission and vision and values of the organization. I can tell you from experience, that is not me. So you don't want me on your board. Um, I'm not a good team player. So you don't want me there. Well, so so Martha, you said this and I'll just, just this quick follow up and then I'll, well, I'd like to, then I'll bounce it to Oase. Um, I, you have said, don't give legal advice. So I'm actually, just for the sake of folks on, on the call here, can you explain why a lawyer on a board should not give legal advice? 
Well, to, because uh, it puts yeah. them in a potential conflict of interest vis-a-vis -vis the organization. And it also raises risks about what if they're wrong um, and the organization has relied on their advice. That's why the um, rules actually, the, the appropriate thing for a lawyer on a board to do is to say, I can't give the advice. However, my firm will, and that's in many, you know, larger nonprofit, uh, nonprofits have relationships with law firms because of this and get this lawyer on the board but not every law firm has that in, is willing to do that and not every um, yeah. lawyer also um, and and you and you got to ask yourself do you want a lawyer who's just there to do that or do you want someone who really gets your work and can contribute like, like any board member Yes, exactly. So, okay, thank you, Martha. So, Oase, hi, Oase, welcome. Hello. So great thank to you. have you here. Nice to see you. You too. So I put the okay. That was enough of the nice. Over to you, Oase. Should there be a Let's, lawyer on the board? And I why, wasn't there, why? and I don't remember what happened. I plead the fifth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think I think the the you know Martha really very uh, articulately captured the gist of it, which is. What is the purpose of your board? And I think that's where all of these conversations always go back to for me. And there's been so much um, hemming and hawing and, and panicking around the role of boards. Um, and I, I think we do make some really big fundamental assumptions about what the role of the board is. And when we start there, when we start unpacking, what is it actually that you want from the people who you are basically hiring to be your boss uh, is the way that I always, I, I always approached it at Why Not was like, I was uh, notorious at Why Not for being very, very, very frustrating to some people in the organization, slow at board member recruitment, because to me, it was the like the most agonizing decision to make was who do we want to give power to fire us? Like, who do we trust enough to trust us enough to do what we need to do? Especially for an organization like ours, you know, Why Not was going through a lot of growth and change and taking risks that not weren't always... Uh, uh, like what, what we could never say to our board is like, here's what we did last year. We're going to do it again this year and everything is going to be great with 1% increase in, in all areas. Like it was none of that. It was a lot of like, this was the crazy thing we did last year that almost uh, killed us. Here's the new crazy thing we're doing. That's going to almost kill us. How do you feel about that? Great. We're going to do it. So, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's really a question of like, what is the purpose of your board in general? And, and I think we have to make a distinction between lawyers as people and lawyers as their as, as their job profession, uh, their job profession, their their profession. And it's a there's something something happens to us around lawyers and accountants and like a couple of different types of jobs where we we conflate the two. And it's like I I think you could absolutely have as Martha's saying a great lawyer on your board who happens to be a lawyer, but the alignment is with your other needs from a, a governance perspective or from the mission vision of the organization. Um, and and the only part of the profession of a lawyer that I feel like is helpful on a board is uh, what I like to think of like, not my lawyer, but a lawyer advice. Because <laughs> uh, because what I do think is helpful sometimes is to have someone who you can talk to who understands how just legal language works, how legal processes work, um, what what things that you may not be aware of that uh, that, that is helpful to get a perspective from uh, someone who is more experienced in that. But that can also be someone you know, like, like, Jeanne, I've, I've said this to you, like, when I have an HR problem, my first phone call was Jeanne always, because she has HR experience. I don't care what your certification is, I care that you have the experience to know what I should do next. That's really what we're actually after. Often when we say I need a lawyer, what we're actually saying is I need someone with experience with certain kinds of legal problems, and knows what to do if those things would happen to me. That's, I think, what we mean often. Yeah. And it is interesting to compare to HR because I've been known to say, maybe it is good to have an HR person on your board, but I also would similarly say, what kind of HR experience? Is it generalist? If it's somebody that's, you know, is it somebody that understands nonprofit and understands nonprofit workplaces? And um, Oasis, if I may, something that you had said before is, and I'm just gonna, again, I'm sort of trying to frame this like for folks that are watching and listening, you know, don't get legal advice, but get lawyerly advice. That was your technical term, Oasis. We're going to put that on a t-shirt. Yeah. Get lawyerly advice. And it's what you're talking about. It's like understanding 
the law from the frameworks and the processes and the methods. Um, which I think is actually sort of leads nicely into the next next question that I'd like to, to talk about, which is so we're, we're moving off from lawyers as the people and I and I actually like that sort of lawyers as people versus lawyers as professionals and I love the fact that all of this started with like yes but who do you want on your board doesn't matter who's on your board and what do they need to be doing and how does that fit in with your mission and vision and what you want to be doing. So let's talk about the law and I think for arts organizations, uh, you know, you you don't worry about the law until it's a big problem and then something blows up and then you really need the law. So I would like to sort of think about how should organizations think about the law and about back to the lawyerly advice as opposed to legal advice. And we and we three talked about what's interesting about sometimes what can what can happen with lawyers where it's it's like, well, we'll wait until there's a problem and then we'll deal with it. And by then time, it's by that time, it might be an adversarial situation as opposed to like, can we think about the law for arts organizations? And we talked about the phrase coming to agreement about things versus having agreements. So because sometimes lawyers would be like, well, we're going to get the best piece of paper, the best contract that protects us. And, you know, we're going to it's going to give us the edge as opposed to we know in this sector, it's collaborative, it's partnerships. We want to come to agreements and things. We do need to protect the organization from risk and making sure that we're hitting hitting fiduciary marks and, and compliance marks. But how do we think about the law in a way that's both healthy for an arts organization, but also is kind of maybe speaking to our values as a sector? And Oase, I'm going to start with you first, and then we'll go to Martha. Um, I may get contradicted uh, by an actual lawyer, but my feeling, and like I, I teach this to my undergrads at Ryerson, uh, where like when I talk to them about contracting, they are, they're, everyone's always like, as soon as you say the word contract, they're like, put on your like lawyer robes and like, let's, let's, let's go to battle stations. And the thing that I, I say to them is like, you're never, ever, ever going to go to court over your $5,000 engagement with the tiny nonprofit. The, like, it's just not going to be worth it. Like the, the justice system, as far as I understand, in my experience, is really not set up for the scale at which most nonprofits work and most, um, like most people in the arts are working at. Like the money involved, it as soon as you've you've called a lawyer, just the billable you know rate is, is going to far outweigh what whatever loss or gain you have. So for me, uh, I think when people approach these things as like, what's our legal risk, and like, is this is this going to be uh, hold up in court or not? Like all that stuff is like we've we've already we're already completely off base. The purpose for me of contracts and agreements is like, do we understand each other, and like, and and can we actually come to this uh, from a place of using these documents as a way to make sure that we understand the principles of our agreement. Um, and document basically whatever it is that we know we want to have happen. Because, you know, the pandemic was a great example last year where like we had tons of things got canceled left, right and center, tons of things that we canceled left, right and center. And, and in a whole bunch of contracts, there were some places where there was like some force majeure clauses. There were some places where there wasn't force majeure clauses. And I can tell you, there was a whole bunch of places where we were like, oh, through this technicality, here's how we're going to get this person to pay for this. And nothing happened. Like basically it was completely 100% relationship based where we had good relationships people were helpful and kind and we helped each other out where we had bad relationships we got nothing and like the deal was over and we weren't going to sue them because it's not really worth it uh and and that's been my approach is like thinking about the law in like the tv sense is not often helpful to the reality of what we are actually doing and and the and 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 then you can start with a place uh that's true to your values uh and be informed obviously but but it doesn't need to be that, I don't know. I feel like it may be a little bit overblown how much law we actually need in our work. Right. And I think, although I think we often say things can be built on relationships. And then if, if that doesn't work, then you do need that piece of paper to fall back on. Because I will say, yes. on the other side, I've seen it where there's not enough written down. And obviously the perspective of like, well, this is what I understood when we talked about it. And this is what I understood. At some yes. point, those written agreements can help kind of confirm but but it. but if you use it for that purpose right to which is to remind yeah. someone hey hey but when you said that we wrote that down remember that's a different purpose than saying yes. okay well i'm gonna see you in court where it says right here like yeah. that that purpose is 
are almost never going to be a win-win solution. Like oh. it's almost always going to be a lose-lose solution. Well, it, well, you might win once and then you've lost a partnership. And you've cost, and, and this cost you more money than it, the problem actually did, you know? Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. Martha. Absolutely. Um, so I, I do, I have three comments, but I'll start with the, I'll start with the last one, which is really the most important point, which is that, as I always say, it's about relationships. Um, I spend a lot of time actually disabusing people of the idea that a contract is going to protect them necessarily from um, issues that are that have that arise in 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 a relationship, um, because if somebody is really hell bent for leather, as they say. Um, to go after you, they'll do that. Um, disgruntled people file employment standards complaints, um, and you know you can have a you can have the the strongest employment agreement drafted by whoever you want. Um, you pay them however many thousands of dollars if you're talking about a, a larger firm, um, and sure you're going to get an ironclad agreement, and that and that person may still not agree that they should not be, they shouldn't have been terminated. They, they have a right to make a claim. And the first thing that an employment standards officer will do is they'll try to get the parties to settle. So you're gonna end up paying money whether you think you should or not. Um, because the, the, the reality is, is that if the relationship is that has, has broken to that extent and you've got that person and usually you know long before this person has made that claim that there's a possibility of this. Um, and, and, and some groups, uh, some non, you know, I deal with a lot with this in the arts and, and outside the arts with, with nonprofits. You know, it's a big shock. It's like, but, 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 and you're like, well, you know, you didn't, you have an, you, you have an executive director who you expect to be able to do all the fundraising they're supposed to be experts in employment. They're supposed to be experts in privacy. They're supposed to be experts in everything. You don't have an HR experience yourselves. And now in the, and in the landscape we're living in day to day right now, we're talking mostly about respectful workplace slash bullying, harassment, uh, sexual misconduct issues. That's what I'm seeing. I see one a week and 90% of them are, are you know, you great. We have a policy. What difference does the policy make if you if you don't know you know you don't have the skills, you don't have the wherewithal to support the relationship, um, and and I think in the arts especially where you're dealing often with people who've put their heart and soul into a piece of work over a period of possibly years. And you know you're in you're past the workshopping stage, and you've got the first production up, and somebody loses their stuff, and it you know that's what that's real life, and you need to be able to respond, and people need to be empowered to respond, and 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 it isn't the speed dial to the lawyer that's going to solve that. It never is, in my experience, and I have you know, several years, a decade of experience as a human rights lawyer and mediator. I, I can say with some certainty that, that I've never seen anybody come out of that process happy. Um, it's, um, so I think the relationship piece is really, really, really important. And I think that mm -hmm. is actually why we do the work, that, why I do the work I do and why why the National Network of Legal Clinics for the Arts is so important, why access to justice is so important, is so that we can also demystify legal concepts, empower people to understand what their obligations are so they don't freak out, um, make things easier to understand. Plain English goes a long way. And this is also something that and this is my last point, which actually was my first point, which is lawyers are notoriously risk averse. And they are the first people when you invite them onto a board who are going to be saying, well, what is our risk? 
and what is our liability and what, what's our coverage and do we have this, especially if they're, and I'm not trying to paint a particular picture here, but if they're young, younger uh, lawyers coming from a big firm with very little experience, maybe they've never been on a board before, and they're, they're, they're not that familiar with the very risky world of making theater or making art, and they come on with a whole lot of expectations that in order for them to be on that board, their firms are telling them, did you check the DNO? Are they, uh, do they have this agreement, not agreement? Do they? And it really becomes this, can be a lot of tension actually between a lawyer on a board who's extremely risk averse and not just staff or, or artistic staff and others, but also other board members who are like, who are you? You know, like, what, what, why do we even need to, why are you pushing us in this direction when mm -hmm. we're already mm -hmm. over here? And we'll cross that bridge when, when we come to it. Um, and, and, you know, avoiding controversies like, you know, the Capture Photography Festival's recent issues in Vancouver with Stephen Shearer, you know, um, and, and people going on the attack and, you know, sometimes having a lawyer on your board can be really helpful. Sometimes it can be like, oh my God, we got to shut it down. Um, and, and yeah, so. So, I mean, here's like, a, I mean, I think what's interesting is like, I, I, there's two things that I want to kind of come back to. So I'm going to go off because one thing about demystifying the legal function for the arts board and always, you and I were working on a project a couple of years ago where we were talking about what's the criteria to think about for a project and looking at artistic criteria and also like, does it serve who we want to serve? And then also you might say, well, what does it mean from a budget point of view, from an HR point of view, and then maybe the legal point of view. And so maybe the answer is, is that legal gets called in when there's, when something, they get called in for the fire as opposed to being called in on a preventative basis and being called in about, so what are the ways that, and it's a, it's a component just like if we are thinking about our, our marketing needs and our fundraising needs and, and how we're serving our community and HR as well as compliance. So I do wonder if there's a role for an arts org, whether it's the lawyer on the board or, but again, it's, I, I always feel like I'm always saying to arts leaders, well, and now you're gonna be I just, you were saying this Martha, like now you're gonna be an expert with this and this and this and this and this. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna like, I'm gonna actually like turn this on this head a little bit and say, when, and I'm going little for, just for if you're following the, the questions, when should an arts organization call a third party lawyer, a third party lawyer? When do you think it's time to spend resources, which is very precious, on billable time with an outside lawyer? And I'm gonna ask a waste the not lawyer first. Um, I, 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 think, I think for me, like I, I will say, you know, just building on the point that you just made about l professional legal advice coming in for when you have a fire versus the uh, not maybe necessarily getting them in, in a preventive way by saying, I have a lawyer on my board, therefore we're going to avoid any, any legal um, risks. Because I, I think that is an important thing to make the distinction of like, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be prepared. <laughs> that doesn't mean that, like, I think in all of what we're saying, we shouldn't also confuse what we're saying with like, you, having a lawyer on your board is a very different thing from saying, uh, or us saying, don't, you don't need a lawyer on your board is very different than saying, you don't need to ever know anything about the law, the law is nonsense, and everything will be fine later, just figure it out. Like, I, in case there's anyone who's <laughs> sitting at home going, okay, the, those really smart people, including one lawyer said, you know, the law is nonsense, so don't worry about it. But it's, it's, the balance there, I think, is like figuring out enough that you need to know. And I think maybe I'll just answer this question from Carol, because it is part of this point, which is, you know, the thing you're saying, Carol, around um, having a lawyer on the board be a coach in terms of compliance things. Uh, like, I think within that, you've answered, to me, the big, big thing that I've always kind of been puzzled about is like, if you want a coach, get a coach. If you want a board member, get a board member. Uh, there's the, the conflation of the two is where I get confused. And why not? We had a pro bono relationship with an employment lawyer who generously committed a certain amount of time to give us employment law advice uh, whenever we needed it. And that person was not our boss. <laughs> and like, we didn't have to do any, anything else beyond we asked for some help and they gave it to us. If that's all you're looking for is a friend who will give you free advice, 
there's a lot of lawyers who'd be happy to do that and put their logo on your website and, and be thankful and give them some tickets. Like you don't need to make them your, like your, your actual boss and governance responsibility. The reason they get risk averse is because it's their risk. They're more liable yeah. than you are. Like it's, it's that, the, that's the part where I get confused of like, why on the board? <laughs> There's so many relationships. And I feel like this about accountants. I feel like this about donors. I feel like this about so many positions that we just assume need to, needs to be on the board is the only way to engage people. And we jump right to that uh, conclusion. And it's like, there's a million other ways you could, you could build a relationship uh, that, that doesn't need this one shot solution. Um, Cause that like, how many boards have we seen blow up in the last year that like, how many more is it going to take before people go, maybe we should be careful about who we bring on our board. And, and, you know, this is kind of Rohit to your point, like, by the time you're asking questions like that, of like, how do I convince my risk averse board to be more risk taking? I'm like, it's too late, wrong board. Like that's right. Again, yeah, now we're like litigating. We're not like, you're not going to change people. <laughs> you've got a, you've got the wrong fit of either leadership or board. Yeah. Someone's going to, going to have to change uh, very drastically. Sorry. What was your question? Oh, when's a good time to get outside lawyer? Um, uh, I, I think, I think as soon as you, as soon as you're in a position for me, at least where, uh, where I go, uh, there is going to be impending or threat of legal action. Like that's when I would, I would immediately get in touch with a professional because uh, as soon as there's a threat of that, that's where I don't want to do anything wrong now. As, yeah. While we're still in like relationship mode, I feel like you can get, you can do a lot on your own um, or generally I have managed to be fine in a lot of situations. And then there's been situations where I've been like, oh, this could, be, this could end in yeah. court. And if it's going to go there, we should be prepared on our side as well. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to respectfully disagree always with a few things Please. you said. Um, and, and, um, and I think it depends a lot on where you are, right? You're in Toronto, mm. uh, a place like Vancouver, very different experience than it might be for in a smaller community where even finding an employment lawyer, like mm. seriously, a sing someone who specializes in employment law mm. in, in a community, random community choice like Kitchener right. or London, uh, who is going to be that available, I, I would, I, I'm not so sure. And, mm. and I think that, um, I think it is about building relationships um, at some level with, with the legal community at the same time, you know, and you can develop relationships with people who love your work, right? I've brought some of our board members and, and, and I certainly every, most people know me as a significant patron of the arts in all disciplines in this town. So it, is, it shouldn't come as a surprise to people that I get what they're doing at least. Um, and there's a few of us out there. Our time, however, is really precious. And I look at it like this. So I've given a lot of thought to this because I started a legal clinic and there's a reason why I did it that way. Um, first and foremost, I think funders need to separate, uh, need to, in their sample budgets, there needs to be a line item for legal that's separated from accounting. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's just no re ration, re reason for an organization with over half a million dollars, not to have, I don't know, a thousand bucks set aside. And right. you may never need it. Ideally, you don't need it, but at least it gives the executive director or the, the board some comfort that there's something there in case they actually do need to get somebody, say, to review their con all of their employment contracts to make sure they're up to date. Um, and, you know, that's another thing. What are the things that, and this is what the legal self-assessment and learning tool project is all about that we're doing, is developing a legal uh, a digital platform that actually answers most questions that you need to know in order to be preventative, to be compliant, to you know, know the difference between an employee and a contractor um, so that you don't end up uh, having to argue that before the employment standards branch or alternatively, the EI people calling you up after your intern has filed an EI claim because they didn't seem to understand that they were not um, employees within the meaning of the Income Tax Act. Um, meanwhile, the organization hasn't been making its remittances 
and um, the contract that this person signed is um, suggests otherwise. It's a mess, but it's a mess because we cobble things together off the interwebs instead of, we've already decided that we can't afford it. Even organizations right. that have the means have decided they can't afford it. Now I admit, mm -hmm. I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to sit here and suggest that um, fees aren't expensive. People are spending hundreds of dollars on haircuts. I'm like, if you can find a few hundred dollars to get your hair done, you can find a few hundred dollars to get, to look, at least make the effort to see, to find some people who might be able to support your nonprofit, um, whether it's an arts group or otherwise. So I, I'm, I would push back a, a bit mm -hmm. about That's the way you very good point. projected yeah. that. Um, and, and I really wanna just, you know, again, go back to why this legal clinic for the arts thing is so important in the national network is because the Department of Canadian Heritage and the Canada Council and here in BC, the BC Arts Council and, and the City of Vancouver Culture have explicitly now told us, we, we agree, these folks need some support. So now you have an opportunity to actually see something happen in these directions. And the only way we're going to be able to meet those needs is if people participate. And they have to participate by acknowledging that sometimes we're gonna need this help. And the, and the funders have to say, yes, we understand that. And so we're, we agree you should, in CADAC, for example, have a line item. The difference that would make, I think culturally, to the, to in, the in the nonprofit sector would be monumental. Right, mm -hmm. because a lot of people are are afraid of us, and and you know, sure, I I'm afraid of hiring a lawyer. I don't want to spend five thousand I don't have, but there's other ways of approaching it, and and I all of us, and there's I don't know sixty to seventy lawyers involved in this project now. Um, you know, we're all out here trying to work on behalf of the arts. It's inspiring, actually as we found yesterday, to listen to all these young people say, I just want to give back. And one way of they're doing it is by these vehicles. But if you're not willing as an organization to even take that step, then that, that's, that's an issue. Um, and no, I think that's great. I mean, it, what's interesting is sort of coming back to, and, and Martha, as you know, like some of the research that I had done a couple of years ago, which was surrounding workplace harassment investigations is, you know, understanding that difference of when do you need to seek outside help specifically depending on the incidences and cases that are coming forward. And that's mm -hmm. as much about protecting the organization as about protecting an un, unbiased and respectful process for all. Right. So I think there's, and then I go back to like what we were talking about the prevention. So if it's a sandwich where you put a lot of attention on the prevention side and then you build the relationships and do the work and then you access it if you need to. It's sort of that the I'm going to use an I'm going to move metaphors from house fire since that feels very angry and horrible. <laughs> you know, this it's the health prevention and then if you need to see a doctor you see a doctor, but you try to really and I think if we if we were able to do more on the prevention side and so to say how do we approach all of this, the, the law, the legal requirements, the agreements, everything, everything that we need to do. Yeah. And there's um, some things we waste money on lawyers for that, like, we don't need to, like, I think you're totally right. We've decided exactly. what we need and decided yeah. what we don't need. And like, I see people spend thousands of dollars on like getting nonprofit incorporated. I'm like, have you tried? It takes yeah, 10 right. minutes and like $200. Like, have you tried to do it yourself? And yeah. we make an assumption that that's something that's well, too scary to do. Yeah. And that's the, that's my, yes, exactly my point. It's like, it's, you know, I don't even get me started on the amount of um, also, you know, this attitude and this exists permeates the consulting world, this attitude that, that consultants have that somehow your records office should be a, a, a law firm. It's like, that's absurd. This is an organization of under $250,000 spending even Five hundred dollars a year mm -hmm. on on this service when we're all online now in BC. It's absurd. It's like mm -hmm. anybody can do this. And you know, we had a. I remember one of the inquiries to um, the solicitors roster was 
a, a fairly significant international organization, a bunch of engineers struggling with how to file an annual report. And they put it out to a bunch of lawyers. And I put up my hand and said, send them to us. I'll get a law student to explain how to do it. That's all they need. Yeah. There's no reason. And <coughs> it's, it's partly the legal profession that, that is in the business of, of maybe uh, mystifying things. But it's also incumbent on, 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 the, on the sectors to mm -hmm. say, hang on, we can demystify this for ourselves. Right. Um, yeah. And, you know, and I really, again, sort of to go back to, um, you know, we're, we, we've created, we're create, uh, for our pivoting to digital series, we've created some contract templates that, it, that set out sort of rights provisions that a lot of small nonprofits are struggling with as they start to stream stuff. We're, we're putting together um, a workbook that will, will hopefully help. Uh, a, a nonprofit to incorporate without the assistance of beyond perhaps a law student. Um, you know, there's lots of things that we could be doing. Um, and we also need the support of the arts sector and say, in the work we're doing in, in right now with the legal clinic, we need you to be saying, this is what we need and telling your funders. Yeah. Um, and speaking out about, hey, this really made a difference for us. And if it was available to everybody, how much more we could be doing. Um, mm -hmm. The, you know, when the, the Sharp Clinic opened, the Community Legal Assistance Society Sexual Harassment and Prevention uh, Legal Clinic that was set up with federal money here in BC, um, they didn't know about the Respectful Workplace and the Arts Project right. that the CR HRC had undertaken. They were completely unaware of it. And as a result, there's this disconnect between here's an amazing resource, five hours oh. of free legal advice to anyone with a complaint in this area. And uh, and 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 uh, and then and as and a sector among other sectors that are like not even aware that that even exists. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of siloing going on. And so you get a bit here and a bit there and a bit there, and that's another thing that we should be sort of as a, as a sector really looking at is, you know, why do we think we, we should have to go there, 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 and there? Why don't we expect more for ourselves? You know, there's that, I hear this a lot, you know, the, 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 the austerity mentality or the starvation, you know, all of us have been nickel and dime to death. And I understand, I, I, as someone who started a nonprofit, <laughs> I understand that feeling, believe me. And we have to get beyond our own sense of that experience to be asking for more of what we need, especially now. Mm -hmm. we, this is the moment where we have to demonstrate that we can start filling some of those gaps that we've known have existed for a long time. And it's one of the reasons, for example, that our focus among other focuses has been to reach out to all of the emerging and not emerging BIPOC led arts organizations to say explicitly, how can we help you? As we ramp up this legal clinic, in Can which is the first in Canada with a staff lawyer, how can we begin by helping you so that when you're set up, you know you don't need to, and will hopefully minimize the likelihood that the scenario that you know about Oase and John and that we're never talking about, uh, and we can all name at least one, um, doesn't happen again. And um, that we really do empower this next generation of um, folks to have a different relationship with their experience, not only with the law, but with lawyers and their own capacity to, to own this business, um, especially, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, well, and I think, I mean, this sort of brings up a conversation that three of us had, which is, you know, in, in the midst of you, there'll be this conference is going to be about building your capacity and fundraising and then this conference is building your capacity in HR and this conference is about this and then in all of this right now and all these collaborative partners 
you know, we're also really facing with trying to do the important work of decolonizing our organizations and implementing true, sincere anti-racism, anti-oppression approaches. And I think, Oase, you mentioned this earlier that like the justice system, what is the construct of the justice system in light of everything that's happening? And then if we kind of assign this like, you know, a legal approach, is that ex exacerbating harm? So in the midst of this, how do we also serve that notion of what we're trying to do in the sector right now? I don't have a great solution, but I, I, I think that point is, is a key one. And like my real talk feelings are that like the justice system is for rich white people. Um, right. And, and, and it, it works really well if you are in that category. Um, but like for everybody else, I think it's at best really intimidating and probably going to be bad. And at, uh, at worst, it, it's, it's uh, predetermined a destiny for your entire community uh, that, is, that is like harm doesn't even begin to capture uh, what, what the justice system does to, to some communities that I don't even need to name because we all live in the same world. Um, so I, I, this is again where I go, you know, we put a lot of stock into these, these um, ideas of the law and the lawyer and the legal systems but they are not necessarily the systems that serve, you know, when we're talking about, if we're shifting to like BIPOC communities, if we're talking about uh, any kind of community that I feel like it has, has, has a much, much different um, level of uh, like your point about, you know, what we assume we can and can't pay for, I think is, is widely applicable to a lot of organizations. And then there's like another tier of organization that's like not even paying themselves anything right now. Like that's in that category of conversation I'm like it's not for you it's not going to be for you like let's just be real and honest about what this is um because I don't think we're serving people really I hope that'll change and I'm sure there's lots of great people working on that and, and solving that problem but in the meantime for me it's like if your values are committed to transformative justice which is a thing I've been hearing more and more come up in all kinds of conversations you can build relationships and contract like you can build a contract to say almost anything you want in terms of how you're going to remediate your uh, disagreements if they come up uh, as long as they're they don't uh, contradict i guess like federal or provincial or whatever laws like you can't you can't supersede uh, uh, the law but you can still come up with your own systems and and i think community led systems would be great they would be better in a lot of cases than uh, us trying to use systems that weren't designed for us that don't really work for us that are kind of, you know, a massive sledgehammer when we're trying to work with like very fragile, uh, I don't mean the communities are fragile, sorry, that was not maybe the best analogy. Um, but but it's, it's, it is something I think that once you bring that lens to this conversation, it really becomes even more imperative that we we're very, very uh, intentional about when and how and why we're interfacing with the legal system. And lawyers are part of the legal system. And like, yeah. there's uh, in this in this list of attendees, I see a BIPOC lawyer from the arts community who went off to law school. And I'm like, this is all dynamic and changing. And it's going to be super interesting to see where it goes. But like, lawyers are part of the legal system, primarily, that is that is their profession, again, separate from lawyers as people as humans, um, they they have much more value than just what they do for work. <laughs> And I think it's, you know, back to like even the very first question, which is like, well, do you need a lawyer on your board? Well, what board do you need to support the goals and the mission of your organization? And I sort of also go back to, you know, policy and rules should be demonstrating your values. I believe in our sector, yeah. in my Pollyanna world. Like, yes, you need to do that baseline compliance fiduciary, but can we come to a place where all of the instruments truly demonstrate your values? And it, mm -hmm. and. And, I, and as as the you know lawyer in the room, or at least in there's other <laughs> there are party. a number of lawyers <laughs> on the on this call with the live um, mic, <laughs> uh, but with the mic, I, I I guess you know a big part of why I do what I do is because I'm trying to figure out ways to to uh, what is that term about I think it was Leonard Cohen cracks in the sky or. You know, cracks appear. Um, and the idea, you know, we, we've hired two um, Indigenous law students um, to work on uh, this project uh, with us. And my hope is, is that we'll begin to develop some of those relationships that will lead to um, the next generation taking on some of these issues 
and um, ensuring that the next generation are supported in their effort to, to, to transform the various rules and systems that we use, whether it's bylaws or constitutional purpose statements or uh, rules of procedure in a meeting, um, what, what our aspirations are, our employment relationships in ways that I, I can think a few of. But um, really, I see my role is to say, hey, you know, let's, let's open the doors here and start seeing what if we say, I, as I've said repeatedly this week, we, we want to be a catalyst for something different to happen as a result. And now, over at least over the next two years, you know, there's there's a bunch of us who are just going to put as much as we can into, hopefully, in some places, building that out. And and you know, I'm not going to prejudge what that what uh, the legal service in, in particularly say for with indig for indigenous artists is going to be. It's I know one thing though, it isn't going to be us running it. I will be, we will be the catalyst that propels it, that supports it and says, do, you know, you guys can do that. We, you don't need me. There's plenty of opportunities to do this. It's just that um, there's not a lot of folks. Creativity in the legal work realm is discouraged. And um, cre people who are creative often uh, like in the litigation end of the of the world that I used to reside, they were they were often ostracized and treated like like some of the cr criminal lawyers. I mean, Clay Ruby, you know, at us at the beginning was not like an exalted senior member of the profession. Mm -hmm. He was seen as you know a crazy man, um, and when he was doing when he was out there advocating, um, and. You know, I think I think we've gone some distance, but we have a hell of a long way to go. And everything about law school and the profession tells us every day we have to we have to do this. And, yeah. and I hope that our project and other projects like this start to go push this open doors. Yeah. It's tough, though. I mean, in NBC, you know, you talk about threat of courts always. You, you just be grateful you're not in BC right now because we have the Civil Resolution Tribunal that now is addressing disputes um, under the Societies Act. And what that means is, is that I'm seeing claims being made against small nonprofits that are now forcing, and, and you're not allowed to have a lawyer involved. Mm -hmm. And like, you wanna talk about panic stricken boards, holy crap, because they know that the amount of hours it's going to take to respond to the claim, forget anything about money and lawyers, mm -hmm. is, is so time consuming. But th that's a vehicle. And the more that people are using it, and we're seeing some really wacky cases, it's like it's exactly the wrong way to go. And yes, uh, you know, and I had this conversation with the attorney general two years ago. I said, please don't do this without an, an educational campaign to support nonprofits with their, with their requirements under the Societies Act, because this is a recipe for people freaking out and ending up needing to spend more money on lawyers rather than help really meaningful prevention self-help and empowerment. Right. Mm -hmm. So Martha, I, we're, we're just, we've got one minute before the hour. Um, there's some questions in the Q&A, but I'm wondering if we can get some of these, I think, I, I think always you have answered the first one that was directed to yeah. you. I think you answered that. Um, kind of touched on one, two. Yeah. Now, uh, Martha, the resources that are through the clinics, are those the, I think, I think um, Angela's been putting some links in the chat. So maybe we can follow up with attendees with what all the various uh, mechanisms that are available through PLEOs. Is that something that we could follow up with the attendees? Angela says, yeah. you betcha. I'm going to ask one question and then, oh, we're at the hour. Do you think there can be a conflict between organizations that employ artists 
and individual artists using the same clinic services. And that maybe maybe that's a follow up that we can. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, because we are going to be the legal clinic with a staff lawyer who is um, on the call uh, yeah. today. Um, Hi, River. We're really looking forward to um, you starting in June. Um, we're really, really excited. Um, and, you know, we're going to have, we're working that, we're going to be working that out. We are in active conversation about how we're going to address the possible conflicts that could arise. I think um, what we're also doing, we're not, we're not going to close the summary advice clinic. We're going to retain relationships with our existing pro bono lawyers so that we have a referral source. Um, and when, when we start to really look at employment uh, issues in particular, which we'll be um, looking at more for the second part of the pilot starting in January, then we may have to make some choices and we are looking at how we're going to resolve those. Because of the availability of, of um, legal support to complainants um, in particular uh, and other individuals, they have more opportunities than a, a small nonprofit arts or non arts organization does to access legal advice. I think we may end up focusing on the, the, the arts organizations ability to access the legal advice rather than the individuals. Um, so as to precisely avoid that issue. Mm. But our hope and I, I'll make one other comment because I think that um, one of the most important issues that is facing us is, is around bullying, harassment, and general risk, what we understand is respect for workplaces. And we are really putting some energy into developing a, a series, which we're calling respectful workplaces, a harm reduction approach, and developing some actual practical tools to support organizations and we're working with SHARP uh, and CLASS on doing the best we can to empower um, organizations, uh, small organizations especially, so that they can start to be good, you know, identify issues ahead of time, understand how to implement policies, um, and develop some of those tools like witnesses. Um, these lay witness program, people are talking about lay people who would be available to be sounding boards. They're not associated with the organization, but they're skilled. Um, so much about conflict, we don't handle well, and we've gotten worse at it, and it's polarizing. And so the idea behind some of those efforts uh, that are going on out here that I'm aware of, I'm hoping we can, we can help again to start getting people to rethink avoiding the adversarial boss person or complainant respondent and get us into a place of of real relate of, of what I guess you would call right relationship mm -hmm. right. and also for for those boards and for leadership to kind of not feel adrift and feel that you know do they have the right information are they taking risks like what how do they and all right. don't all resign on mass when there's a problem, right? So, like this is the standard response. It's like, oh my God, better go now. Bye. As if that doesn't that also not actually alleviate you of liability for another few years? Like, no. not if you not if there's been a serious breach while mm -hmm. you were the director. Yeah, so hope. you're still on the hook whether you're or not you resigned. I mean, if. <laughs> If there's a wrongful dismissal action taken against the society and you were on the board at the time and you didn't do your due diligence by asking the, the executive director for the explanation for why they took X and Y action, in mm -hmm. theory, that, that liability will follow you until, you know, until you, until the CRA decides to stop sending you letters. And who knows <laughs> who that person is who says, aha. I think I'll stop sending the nasty letter today, you know, because I wonder about those things. I want, you know, I have, I know people who've gotten letters years after mm. issues arose and it's like, 
but you know, eventually they stop because you can't get blood from a stone, but that's another conversation. All right. Well, we're, we're <laughs> over the hour, so I'm going to suggest we, we bring this to a close. Um, uh, thank you always. I, I often like to, to cajole him or volunteer him to join. And it's always a great, and I knew that Martha and Oase would have a great conversation, which is the case. Martha, I'll hand it over to you and the team to close out. And I know this is the closing of your entire uh, forum for the three yeah, days. This is, uh, this is the last event of our jam pack schedule. Um, and I, you know, I want to thank you, Jean and Oase for making uh, today's event is as, as, as enjoyable. Um, I, I clearly need to paint my walls. Um, and also the staff, uh, you know, this has been an effort that has taken uh, weeks of preparation. Uh, Francella Fialis uh, is our fearless uh, brand new project manager for the National Network of Legal Clinics for the Arts. Uh, Angela Venatter who has stuck with us this past year doing event after event after event after event uh, and really pulled out all the stops to make this successful. Uh, Paige Louder, um, our administrator, Alan Hennessy, our clinic coordinator, Francis Chang, our interim clinic director, um, Andrew Singh, our technology director, uh, Sean Cranberry, our uh, director of communications, who's been uh, stick handling, MacGyvering as much as uh, anyone possibly can. Nora de Mariafi in Newfoundland, um, who's been uh, working so hard in the Atlantic region and across uh, all the all the country to get everybody, keep everybody on task. And uh, Sheldon Falk, who's just come back from his, after finishing his exams, hallelujah, um, our legal content lead, who is the person who will be working with me all summer long on whatever resources people think they may need, we'll do our best uh, to get stuff out to you. So, uh, and thanks again to our funders. Um, we would not be here without uh, the support of um, of all of you uh, and your belief in our 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 hope, which is to build resiliency uh, across wow. the nonprofit sector and most specifically for the arts. So thank you all, and um, I hope I didn't forget anybody. I have a feeling I might have done, but. Um, I'll feel really bad later, I guess. <laughs> so thanks again and goodbye. <laughs>